Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the show here on Collider Video where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the senior producer over here at Collider Video. And how do you get one of your questions on our show? Here's how you do it. You simply email us to collidervideo at gmail.com. Just send in your mailbag questions and maybe you'll see your question pop up on Movie Talk sometime Monday through Friday, or maybe you'll see it pop up on here on the weekends on Mailbag. Um, this is a great weekend for us around here. Number one, it's Ray's birthday. Ray is our, uh, of course, our graphics guy, our behind the scenes guy who works with Dennis and a big happy birthday to him. We're gonna be going out and celebrating tonight a whole bunch of us from the crew, we're going to be going out to Hollywood and watching the Ronda Rousey fight tonight, the big UFC. We're big UFC fans around here, as some of you may know, because Dennis and I are talking about it all the time ad nauseum. And uh, Ronda Rousey has pretty much become the biggest superstar. I mean, it was funny because like three years ago, maybe a few, uh, another year or two more than that, there wasn't even women fighting in the UFC. There was no women's division. And now, just a couple years later, Probably, arguably, the biggest star, uh, the highest pay-per-view draw, like, is a female fighter in Ronda Rousey, who is just absolutely a beast. And I cannot wait to watch her destroy yet another opponent tonight, which is going to be a lot of fun. So, hey, listen, without much further ado, let's get into the mailbag. Now, for those of you who might be new to Mailbag, this is a very, um, as you can tell, a more casual show. I'm saying I'm going to stop and take a drink. We'll talk a little bit of behind the scenes stuff about Collider Video, and we'll talk a lot more informally and uh, just kind of yap like film fans would. So with all that out of the way, let's get to our first question of the day. And our first question today comes to us from James McKenzie. And James writes, Hey guys, how's it going? Loving the new show. Uh, my question is, what would it take for a horror film to win Best Picture? Do you think a true slasher film could ever win if done right? Um, well, thanks a lot for the question, James. You know, I, we had a question kind of similar to this, but there's going to be a fairly different answer. Um, probably a couple months ago, when somebody was asking that about comedies, somebody asked about, you know, what would it take for a comedy to win Best Picture? And, you know, comedies have been nominated for Best Picture uh, several times. Uh, I can't remember the last time one uh, actually won the Academy Award. But horror. Um, now, there's a part of this answer that's the same for comedy, and there's a part that's different. The part that's the same that you know, answer that we gave for one for comedy is this, is that movies that win Best Picture generally are films that do multiple things really well. You know, they, you know, with a comedy, the most important part for a comedy to work is to make people laugh. But to make a great overall film... You have to do more than just one thing right. Like you want to have good characters. You want to have great writing. You want to have perfect, you want to have perfect or near perfect story development. You want to have a depth to your narrative and to your plot. You want to have some intricacy to your plot. You want to have, you know, excellent direction and excellent this and excellent that. And you want to have a whole bunch of these things that come together to create the single package that you call this is the best picture of the year. And one of the things that have been the weaknesses of comedies, and I think this part at least, can the same can be true of horror, is that comedy tends to focus on one thing. They don't all, absolutely they don't all, I'm just saying generally speaking, tend to focus on one element, which is make the audience laugh. That's its primary purpose. And with horror, you know, their primary purpose is to give their audience the creeps or scare them or, you know, and there's different ways of doing that, of course. And once again, I'm speaking in general terms. Like these are not blanket answers for everything. I'm just talking in general terms, okay? And, you know, because we often say on the show that a comedy, since its main thing is to make the audience laugh, if a comedy does almost everything else wrong, doesn't give us interesting characters, doesn't have great dialogue, doesn't have, you know, a complex but rich plot, a good pace of narrative and all, if it doesn't have any of that, but it makes you laugh throughout the film, then we as audience members will totally give it a pass on everything else it didn't do right because they've achieved its main goal, which is just make us laugh. With horror, it's kind of the same thing, but it, it's but instead of laughing, it's like give us the creeps or give us the scares, whatever. A horror film can do a lot, almost everything else wrong, but if it achieves its goal of giving you a lot of scares and making you jump out of your seat or make you feel super creepy or make you feel like when you go home you got to keep the lights on in the house, 
then we will give almost everything else that a horror movie maybe does wrong a complete pass. Now, the opposite is true as well, right? You can go to a movie like a Will Ferrell, John C. Riley brand new comedy, and they call it a comedy, and it can do a lot of other things right. Like maybe it's got really interesting characters, and maybe it's got actually really intricate and, and impressive and important and good moving f- plot and all that kind of stuff, but all of its jokes fall flat. So now the opposite is true. It can do almost every a comedy can do almost everything else right if it doesn't bring the laughs we as an audience will consider it a failure. Same as horror. You know, it can bill itself as a horror and it can do all those other different things right. But if it fails in its attempts to make us feel a sense of creepiness or if it fails in its attempts to make us feel scared or whatever, then we will generally consider it a a failure because, you know, we go in with different measuring sticks depending on the genre. For best film though, you're looking for something and the Academy is looking for things that bring multiple things to create one complete package. That can be a comedy, that can be a horror. And where the answers differ between comedy and horror is this. I believe horror films are actually better positioned to say someday win an Academy Award as best picture than comedies are. Because I generally find, obviously speaking, there are different levels to this. Um, but horror films, especially the ones that focus on, you know, suspense and the creepiness and the dread and the fear rather than the, ah, like rather than say, you're asking about true slashers. I don't know that true slashers have much hope of ever winning a best picture because true slashers are actually quite thin um, in how they approach and what it is they're trying to do. They're, the experience is just as good, but you know, they want to scare you. They want to make you jump and go, woo, and be grossed out. And they want to give you that fun experience. And because of that, I mean, that you really don't need to focus on much else to achieve that. And so I don't think it's going to happen. But then there's other types of horror films, right? Like there's not one kind of horror film. There are many subgenres of horror. Horror is a much more complex genre than a lot of people give it credit for. Because where you can get like a, you know, uh, Friday the 13th part five, where it's just all about Jason jumping out of the closet and slashing somebody with his machete, which can be great and fun and awesome. Then you have other types of horror films, like a lot that come say out of the Asian market, which focus a lot on atmosphere and dread and fear and things like that, that just kind of psychologically shake you to your core as well. And in those types of horror films, I find in those horror films, they generally tend to spend more attention on setting up environment on setting up dynamics, on setting up the characters, on setting up depth and all that kind of stuff, because those actually play into the environment of fear that they're trying to create. So whereas, you know, you'll get the odd comedy like 40-Year-Old Virgin, which is absolutely brilliant, or a comedy like or like Tootsie and things like that, that actually have really interesting characters that we get addressed to. And, and actually, when you peel back the layers, it's actually a really very good plot and story and the pacing of everything. I find a lot more with horror films, they pay more attention to that. At least the, you know, the psychological um, atmospheric kind of horror films as opposed to the pure slashers. So can a, can a horror film win Best Picture? I think yes. You ask, what will it take? It will take not only achieving the things that they're trying to achieve as their main purposes, the scares, the fear, and all that kind of stuff, but also equal attention to the other parts of a movie, which are deep characters, plot progression, character development, all that kind of stuff. And I would actually venture a guess to say, I think a horror film has a better chance of winning a Best Picture at the Academy Awards um, before a comedy does. Uh, Not a pure slasher film, because like I said, I don't think pure slashers are really positioned to do that super well. But, you know, the the good psychological kind of horror films that even if they're supernatural and all that kind of stuff, that play more to those elements, I think they have a great chance at at some point, someday, at least more than comedy. Just my two cents worth. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Hector. And Hector writes, Hello, guys. Greetings from Houston, Texas. I was wondering if any of you would explain the first appearance rule Marvel has with their characters when they are with other studios. For example, Black Panther first appeared in Fantastic Four, but he is getting a Marvel movie with Marvel Studios. Do you think that Black Panther should be long to Fox? Your thoughts. Okay, well, there's this highlights a, a, a misunderstanding amongst a lot of film fans about how you know, what is the procedure? What is the formula for determining which character can appear with which studio? You know, which character, which Marvel comic book character will appear in a Fox film or a Sony film up until recently, uh, as opposed to a Marvel Studios film? And most of the theories out there are wrong. There is no formula 
for determining which character will appear in which film. It was all determined which character will appear in which film or with which studios way back in the day when Marvel first started selling the rights to their characters. It was all in painful detail. Like, some people seem to be under the impression that Marvel and Fox signed this deal where it's, okay, uh, basically, yeah, X-Men characters will appear in your movies and uh, non-X-Men characters will appear in our movies. And we'll just kind of figure it out as we go along. It's like, hmm, we've got, we've got Bishop now. Should he count as an X-Men character? Okay, he counts as an X-Men character. Oh, but, you know, what about Quicksilver? Oh, what do we do with Quicksilver? Because he was in the Avengers in the comics and in the X-Men universe in the comics. Oh, how should we figure this? Nah, that doesn't happen. It was all laid out and determined when the deals were signed. Um, that's how legally these contracts and things like this work. The lawyers do not leave anything to chance for later. Like the last contract negotiation I was in, which was far less important than, you know, Marvel and Fox determining the multi-billion dollar deals. But like even in, in the most recent uh, contract negotiations I had for something, it was like, okay, Sundays, this happens, and Tuesdays, this happens, and in the event of this happening here, like, like so many minute details were figured out and put into contracts. So there are some people out there who, because, you know, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch uh, are appearing in both Fox films and in Marvel films, that, oh, they just came to an agreement and said, no, 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 that was determined when they wrote out the contract ages ago, that Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, can be in both. These are the ones, but if one appears here and one appears there, then it's handled differently. They didn't, you know, Marvel didn't just figure out, oh, we'd like to make a Black Panther movie. Let's go talk to Fox about maybe who gets to use Black Panther. No, all of that was determined a long time ago. Um, so when they came up with this contract, it was all laid out ages, ages, ages. There are comic book characters that we've never even heard rumors about getting their own movies. But trust me when I tell you, it's all those characters that we've never even heard rumors of getting their own movies. It's already been determined ages ago which studio would have the rights to use that character in the contracts that the original originally wrote years ago. It's not made up as they go along. So I hope you find that helpful. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Ben. And Ben writes, loving the new digs at Collider. Uh, technically, they're not new digs. It's just we gave the set a paint job. But anyway, loving the new digs at Collider uh, seemed like a really smooth transition. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Ben. It actually has been a remarkably smooth transition, uh, especially thanks to all of you guys, our viewers who have followed us over. Anyway, getting back to your question. Here's my question. Why does someone like Adam Sandler keep on making trashy movies, to say kindly, and someone like Mike Myers makes one or two bad movies, Cat in the Hat and Love Guru, and basically quits acting? Um, good question, Ben. I love Mike Myers, and I'm not just saying that because he's a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. I am not just saying that because he grew up up the road from where I grew up. I am not just saying that because he's a good Canadian kid. I love Mike Myers. I think it's safe to say most of us love Mike Myers. Um, his comedy, So I Married an Axe Murderer, I think is one of the underappreciated gems in comedies. I'm not going to say it's in my top 10 favorite of all time, but man, it would be close. So I Married an Axe Murderer is brilliant. Because when we think of Mike Myers' comedy, understandably, a lot of us default to thinking about Austin Powers, right? Because he was so successful with Austin Powers. But So I Married an Axe Murderer is a total gem of a comedy. If you have not seen So I Married an Axe Murderer, please find it. Uh, I believe it's on Netflix. I could be wrong about that, I think. But if not, find it on Amazon Prime. Find it somewhere. Find it on the Google Play Store, whatever. Find it in the iTunes library, whatever. Find it and treat yourself. Watch So I Married an Axe Murderer. Um, but... You're ask, actually asking two different questions. I mean, it's this isn't a matter of um, Adam Sandler puts out five bad comedies in a row, and that's it's at least five bad comedies he's put out in a row. Um, and studios, why do studios keep giving it him movies? Well, because they make money. At least until recently, they, they were making money. The audience is starting to clue in that his comedies aren't good anymore. Um, versus Mike Myers, who like puts out one or two bad ones. And I'll be honest, I didn't hate Cat in the Hat. I didn't hate it. Love Guru, I don't know what happened there. 
I really don't. It, it, it was almost like, I don't know if it was a studio pressuring Mike to, hey, people love you as Austin Powers, do another kind of wacky character. And Love Guru was just basically an unfunny Austin Powers with a different sort of, uh, you know, wild personality he was, you know, developing. It it was just failed on every level. The Justin Timberlake was awful in it. Just everybody was terrible and it. it was an awful, awful film. But... Unlike the Adam Sandler thing where, you know, the, the studios have kept, kept offering anything, my understanding of it is Mike Myers, it's not like after Love Guru horribly just tarnished everything. It's not like the studios then, oh, well, we got to give up on Mike Myers. No, Mike Myers was a moneymaker for them. I really think, and I, I have nothing to back this up with, but this is understanding that he got offers and understanding that the audience was still there for him. After one horrible film, some people would say two with Cat in the Hat. Fine, I'll give you that. But I think the audience was still there. I think the studios were willing to give him more shots. You know, one or two trip ups doesn't doesn't kill everything. I honestly think um, he was just crushed by it. I, I think he was personally devastated, not just at the failure of the movie itself, but I think he was devastated by he was now getting hit with criticisms that he probably had never heard before. Like, I don't think he was ever used to, like, when you look at Wayne's World and all the other stuff he did, you know, I think there were a lot of, this was the first time in his career where, en masse, the audience was just negatively throwing stuff at him. And I think it, I think it hurt. I think it hurt him. And I think at that point, he decided to step back and just step away. And he's been out of the limelight ever since. He's been dabbling in directing. He, he, was, he directed um, uh, something about the Mensch. Uh, I forget the actual title of the um, of the document, but he directed a documentary lately, so I know he's been dabbling in that. I unapologetically yearn for the return of Mike Myers. I want Mike Myers back on my screen in comedies um, because we need him. I think we need him, and I think he's great. So this isn't an issue like studios keep giving Adam Sandler stuff, but they won't give anything to Mike Myers. I think this is a personal decision by Mike Myers to make a decision to step away. And I don't know if it was to lick his wounds or I don't know if he just decided, to, look, I've been doing this all my life. I want to step away from it. I don't know what the issue is, but it's a little bit different than the Adam Sandler stuff. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from James Cheery. I love that last name, Cheery. Anyway, James Cheery writes, hey guys, loving the new shade of green to the place. Thank you very much. With Disney in the middle of remaking their animated movies into live action, what about The Hunchback of Notre Dame? It's easily Disney's darkest film, which makes it brilliant, and I wish to see them go back there and maybe take the darker stuff further. Love to hear your thoughts. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Jamie. Um, or uh, James, I should say. I, I really like the animated... Uh, 1996, I believe, is the year that it came out, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And a, a couple of interesting facts. Um, the uh, gargoyle, remember there were three gargoyles in it? The gargoyle Hugo is actually voiced by uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. He he was uh, Costanza in, um, George Costanza in Seinfeld. And I love him. I think he's terrific. Demi Moore did the, the voice of Esmeralda. And the two guys who directed it, and this might be why the movie is so, I think, so good, was de uh, developed by guys named Gary uh, Truesdale and um, uh, Kirk Wise. Uh, Kirk Wise uh, directed it. And these are the same two guys who directed Beauty and the Beast, which is, in my opinion, one of, I mean, I think most of us would agree. Uh, we, we could debate on whether it's the greatest film of all time, the greatest animated film of all time, but we, I think most of us agree it's one of the greatest animated films ever made. It was the first animated film, Beauty and the Beast, to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Not this little trifle Best Animated Oscar. I mean, the real big award, Best Animated Picture. And that was in the day when only five movies were nominated for Best Picture at a time. It's not like uh, when a couple of the Pixar films nowadays have been nominated when there are 10 nominees. This is back in the day when there were only five and Beauty and the Beast. And the other funny thing about this is that Truesdale and, um, uh, and Wise, they didn't really do much after Hunchback of Notre Dame. I thought Hunchback of Notre Dame was great. Was it as good as Beauty and the Beast? No. But when you get these two guys who directed Beauty and the Beast which got nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And then they do um, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and I th and which I thought was really, really good. You'd think they'd have about eight or nine other big films to their credits afterwards, and they really don't. So it's kind of interesting there. Anyway, 
I totally agree with you. Hunchback of Notre Dame was one of the darkest Disney animated films they've done, especially when that that one song when the villain's singing about Esmeralda, she'll burn, and you know, all that. It's like, this is kind of heavy, but it was, artistically, it was very well done. Now, you say, you mentioned your, um, in your email that it's one of the darkest, darkest, which makes it brilliant. Eh, I don't, I don't buy it out there. I don't think making it dark, dark is not equivalent with good. It's just not. Um, you do what is best for your story. Like if you did Beauty and the Beast really dark, that doesn't serve the story. The the right tone for Beauty and the Beast was the tone that they had. There's a little bit of dark in there. Sure there was, but you do what serves the story best. I don't think what made Hunchback of Notre Dame good was the fact that it was darker than other Disney films. I just think that a little bit darker is was the proper tone for that particular movie. And that's what fit. So I, I, there's this misunderstanding out there. Some people believe that, oh, if you make something dark, that means it'll be better. That's not true. That's not true at all. But there are some films that that's the tone they should have. And so therefore it is better when they adopt it. And I do think Hunchback of Notre Dame was one of those films. Um, I would love to see a live action one. Now, remember, there have been, I mean, look at the, the, the image right here. There have been live action Hunchback of Notre Dame movies. So this wouldn't be a new thing, but a live action adaptation of the 1996, and I believe it's 96, um, Disney animated film Hunchback of Notre Dame, I think I would be all on board for that. And now Disney, of course, has about four or five animated films to live action in development right now, including Beauty and the Beast, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, so it might be a little while before we hear one, but trust me, if a couple more of these Disney hits, these Disney animated film to live action hits. Now, you know, I, I didn't like their Alice in Wonderland. There's another one coming out. I didn't like Maleficent, even though Angelina Jolie was brilliant in it. I didn't like the movie, but Cinderella that they just did this past year was fantastic. I thought their Cinderella adaptation was great. And if they do a couple more hits like that, if Beauty and the Beast knocks it out of the park, they're talking about doing a Dumbo one, they're talking about doing a Prince Charming one, They're talking. there's several others. If a couple more of these hit, trust me, it will not be long before we hear that they are doing a Hunchback of Notre Dame to live action adaptation from the animated film. And I'm really looking forward to it. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Josh Bullington, who writes... Hey guys, I love the show and watch every day. Thanks so much, Josh. Really appreciate your support. My question is about the next Suicide Squad trailer. With the trailer from Comic-Con blowing up online so much that Warner Brothers had to just release an official one that I'm guessing probably wouldn't have been released until around Christmas time. Does that mean we probably won't be getting another trailer until around March for Batman vs. Superman? Or do you think we still might get one more between now and then? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And thanks again for being the best damn movie-related talk show on the planet. Well, thanks so much for the question, uh, Josh. Now, I'm going to pull up here. Actually, let me look it up. I'm going to look up. I should have had this out in front of me, but I'm going to look up the release date for Suicide Squad. Uh, let's see. Suicide Squad. And it gets released on August 5th, 2016. So the movie is still a year away. Um, and I, you know what? You mentioned something that... Look, obviously Warner Brothers was not planning on releasing the Suicide Squad trailer that they premiered at Comic-Con. They were not planning on releasing that online uh, as fast as they did. Now, but I believe I heard that they were planning on releasing it like two weeks or two months later, something like that. Anyway, so it was going to be before Christmas that they were going to release it. It wasn't going to be, you know, hidden for that long. But it does raise the question. If they weren't, let's say for argument's sake, they weren't going to release that Suicide Squad trailer until September or October. Okay, fine. If that was their original plan, then when, what's their plan for releasing a second trailer? And I think December. I, I, I think we'll get another, I think we're going to have to wait about another five or six months before we get another Suicide Squad trailer. And that's good because Suicide Squad is still more than one year away. You know, it's in five days, it'll be officially one year away. So why start dropping two or three trailers, you know, that early? So I think since they were planning on releasing this Suicide Squad trailer a little bit later from now, 
I think we're probably looking at Christmas time. I, I don't think we'll have to wait until, th until 2016 for a second trailer. I think they'll drop a second trailer sometime between now and Christmas, but I think it'll be in November, December. That's just my guess. Watch, they're going to drop a new trailer in two weeks. Eh, that's the way things work. But my guess is going to be uh, at the very end of 2015, we'll get a second trailer. All right, let's move on to the next question. Got three more to go. And this question comes to us from David Bagshaw, who writes, Hey, green team, keep up the great work. Thank you very much. My topic of conversation comes in the form of Star Wars Rogue One, as in, what's the point? All I'm suggesting is that I know it's a standalone film in, in essence, so it shouldn't really be expected to, but it will not, at least with the information I have about the film, further the Star Wars franchise any. I mean, we already know the end of the film. The good guys get the Death Star plans. Roll credits. Do any of you guys objectively see Rogue One as a cash-in? Well, thanks a lot for the question, David. And let's... Uh, Let's get one thing out of the way first. And you know, I know I always bring this up whenever somebody mentions that movie's a cash grab, that movie's a cash in, whatever. Every film ever made in the history of Hollywood production, and most of them are Hollywood productions, have been cash ins. They are all cash ins. Anybody who tells you otherwise is lying or extremely naive. They are all cash ins. Nobody ever put up $50 million and say, yeah, well, here, I'll just throw this 50 million away and uh, I don't care if it makes money. No, 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 no. You get investors to pay for your movie by convincing them this movie can make money. No film has ever been approved where the filmmakers know and the people behind the scene, the people writing the checks know that this movie's gonna lose me $10 million. This movie's gonna lose me $50 million. It is the film business. It is the, say it with me, Film business. It's about making money. It's like the car business. Ford isn't in it to do this, that, or the other thing. Ford makes cars to make money. Each car they produce is because they believe that car is going to make us money. Every movie that a studio decides to release, they release it because they believe it can make them money. Movies being cash in is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all because that's what they all are. Now, getting to your other point is, um, you know, what's the point of Rogue One? It's not going to further the Star Wars story. So, and we know how it ends. The good guys win. Here's the thing. Everybody knows that I'm generally opposed to prequels. I don't like prequels. I mean, look, I'm going to be there to see a young Han Solo movie. I'm totally going to line up and maybe it'll be great. But would I have rather them do something else? Yeah, I would have rather them spend their time and energy making something else. Because I already know this character. This character is not going to die. What, what are you going to do Han Solo movie? Han Solo, there's a big epic end battle. And you don't know if the good... Because guess what? In the today's modern age, sometimes the good guys die. But anyway, um, you know, Han Solo is going to be hanging off the Millennium Falcon over a deep, deep canyon and the movie's coming to its climax. Will he fall and die? Well, obviously he doesn't. We know this. Rogue One, I got to say, though, is different from a prequel per se, because it's not going to be Han Solo starring in Rogue One. It's not going to be Luke Skywalker starring in Rogue One. It's not going to be Princess Leia. It's going to be a new set of characters. And yes, Darth Vader, we already know, will be a, a, a side character in that and something because he's part of the environment of that universe. That only makes sense. But while we know the good guys get the Death Star plans, we know that. That's all we know. Like there is going to be five sets of heroes and villains in this movie, and we are going to have no idea if they live or die. We are just not going to know. How do they get the Death Star plans? Um, was getting the Death Star plans, did they have to get a, a, a different way than they thought? Did they get all of them? Did, they, did everybody die in the attempt? Did, did everybody get out alive and bring the Death Star plans triumphantly to, you know, that moon on Yavin 4? Like, what, what's happening here? How is this going to happen? We don't know. So this is this is unique amongst the, the concept of prequels. And everybody knows I don't like the idea of prequels, and yet I'm okay with this one. The other thing is, getting to your point about this movie doesn't further the Star Wars story. So what's the point? The point is making a good movie. The, the point is giving us a good standalone movie. Not Everything has to be looked at through the goggles of franchises. 
Not everything has to be looked at through the goggles of sequels. I mean, because with that mentality, we could sit back and go, because remember, these Star Wars standalones are anthologies. They're, they're their own isolated, contained stories. Because if we logically follow that argument through, we could sit there and say, what was the point of Shawshank Redemption? I mean, what was the point of that movie? There was not going to be a sequel, and it didn't further the cinematic universe or create a cinematic universe. So what was the point? The point was given us one of the greatest motion pictures in the history of cinema. That was the point. And, and one that could make the studio money. Rogue One, the hope is, I think this story about, you know, this, this development of this rebellion, getting the, this galactic empire, finding to get these things, I think this sounds like it could be a terrific story and a fun time at the movies. Who cares if it doesn't further the story of Luke Skywalker? Who cares if it doesn't further our understanding of Yoda off on Dagobah? Who cares? You just give us a great movie. And that's the point. So the point is they think they've got something that will make a great movie and will make them a lot of money. So what's the problem? I, I, I honestly, I just, I just don't see the problem here. Number one, all films are made to make money and a, a, name, a movie with the name Star Wars in front of it is greatly positioned to make money. And do you have a great idea and are you bringing on a great director and great storytellers, which they are, to tell that story that would be a good story? Because remember, one of the things Hollywood is learning now it hasn't always been this case, but Holly's now learning. You can have movies that are going to make a ton of money no matter how terrible you make them, Transformers 4. But what they are realizing, though, is that the better your movie, the more money it will make. And trust me, Hollywood is all about greed. It's all about greed. And greed is good, as we learned from Wall Street. Um, so they know, okay, we can make this trash and we'll make you know, $100 million. But man, if we put effort in this and make it really good, it'll make $170 million or it'll make $115 million. And don't ever fool yourself into thinking, ah, the big Hollywood studios don't care about an extra $15 million. You're damn right they do. They care about that a great deal because greed works. So yeah, who says it, it needs to further the story of Star Wars? This is its own anthology movie, a self-contained one-shot movie like most movies that come out in theaters. So let's go and enjoy it and hope that they make a lot of money. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Antonio Ibarra. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, properly, Antonio. And Antonio writes, Greetings and salutations, Collider Movie Talk crew. Question. Are the chances of you live streaming again any better after the move to Collider? Or are you facing the same difficulties as aforementioned? Either way, I watch the show daily, so keep up the great work. Well, thank you so much for the uh, for the question, Antonio. Um, yeah, so as those of you who've been watching Movie Talk for a long time, for a, for a while, well, Movie Talk didn't start as a live streaming show. But for about a year and a half, or almost two years, we did do the show as a live streaming show. And we would do Movie Talk at 11 a.m., um, Pacific Standard Time, and it would live stream, you could watch it live, and then it would go up on YouTube afterwards, so you could watch it afterwards as well. When we moved into, and some of you know this already, when we moved into our brand new studio here in Burbank, California, um, it is a glorious studio, just a terrific creative space for us with offices and, and studio space and multiple stages and dressing rooms and conference rooms and things like that. It's great. We love it here. But one of the drawbacks was that we didn't have internet service in here. None of the internet companies natively have already serviced this building or serviced this area. And I kid you not, I'm not, there's no hyperbole here. To get one of the major internet service providers to run service into this building, it was going to cost us $30,000 up front. I don't have $30,000. I, if you do, please send it to me. Um, even if it's not for internet, just no, seriously, send me $30,000. Anyway, um, and so what we did was we, need, we needed some kind of internet in here. And what we did was we got these little um, cellular network LTE hotspot boxes. And that was basically the same internet that your phone gets, right? And that became our internet service. Now that is not either fast enough, and sometimes it was fast enough, but it was not stable. 
And so it wasn't reliable, reliable enough for us to do live streaming at HD video. That takes a lot of solid bandwidth. And we just didn't have it. So we thought, okay, we will get internet in here someday. Uh, and until then, we can't do live streaming. So we went to not live streaming anymore. And now, I'm pleased to announce, we have just ordered internet service. It's going to take us about two or three months to get it put in the building. But we're going to get solid internet service in here. So I'm very excited about that. That means we are going to be able to live stream some stuff. But Dennis Zen and I have been talking a lot over the past couple of months about do we even want to go back to live streaming? Because, and I'm not so, I, honestly, I'm not sure that even once we get this great solid internet in here, I don't know that movie talk, Collider movie talk, the Monday through Friday show, I don't know if we're going to make that a live streaming show again. Uh, we will certainly do some live streaming shows and some live streaming events from here, but will we do movie talk? I'm not so sure. I'm not saying no, but I'm also saying we're not, we're not at yes either. Here's why. We have found that it's actually made our lives a lot easier not doing it live. Because when you're doing it live, you have to start at 11 a.m. If people are running late, no matter if you're technical problem. And then, man, I tell you, there were some days when we were doing the live show where we would run into a couple of technical problems. Like we'd be 10 minutes late and we would have people screaming and swearing at us in the chat board or sending us emails. What the F? You're supposed to start at 11. Be professional and start at 11. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Do you want your money back? Oh, that's right. You get this show for free. Shut up. Anyway. Um, and we would try our best and things wouldn't happen. So that was irritating and always, you know, start whatever. Whereas when we don't do a live, hey, guess what? Schnepp's got another meeting in the morning and he asked if we can, instead of shooting at 1030 in the morning, can we shoot at 1115? And we can go, yeah, yeah, we can do that. We'll shoot at 11.15 that day. No big deal. Because we don't have a hard start time that we have to meet for our live audience. Um, it also means if, you know, when we stream live, we could not, you know, have any mistakes. Because if we make a mistake, that's it. It's done, you know. Now, when we make a mistake um, with something, with whether there's an editing problem or the wrong graphics came up or anything, right? No big deal. We just we just fix that later. After we're done shooting the show, we'll just fix that in post production, render it, upload it. No problem. Everything's fine. Whereas live, we didn't have that that uh, that luxury. A couple of other problems with this, though. While our comment section in our videos that go up on YouTube, we have the best commenters in there, and you know, there's great discussion and debate and stuff like that. Man, live, the trolls really come out. The, the trolls come out. As a matter of fact, I tried test uh, testing a live stream mailbag last weekend. And I ended up pulling it afterwards because I didn't think I was very good in it. Some of you will think I'm never very good. And that's fair enough. But even for my own perception, I was not very good on it. And I thought you guys deserved better than what I gave that day. So I pulled the show down. But one of the other problems I noticed, because um, it was up on YouTube for about an hour or two. And a lot of people responded about, you know, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 people watched live. And I had a lot of people emailing me saying, man, the trolls um, in there that were just flaming everything made it really not enjoyable. Made it really not enjoyable. I'm not going to watch live again. And that's what I had some people telling me. And that's hard to moderate live and on the fly. And, and it just, it, you know, my thing is about, I want us to create the best experience for our viewers. And if watching it live, if it became unenjoyable because there are some people that we just had a very hard time moderating, just decided, oh, I'm just going to use this to go in and, and try to draw attention to myself and just flame because I have no life. It's hard to control that. And when we don't do shows live, that's a lot easier to manage. But the other thing is this. The other reason why we're not just jumping up and automatically saying, yes, we're going to do live again is because, you know, one of our shows will get anywhere between 60 and 100,000 views, right? But only two to 3,000 people would watch live. And it's not that those two to 3,000 people aren't important. They are totally important. But it was like, that they only represent about 5% of our audience. So what Dennis and I, when we were sitting down and discussing this, we thought, do we want to put in 25% more effort? Make sure we start on time, nothing could go wrong, all, all this kind of stuff. Do we want to put in 25% more hassle for 5% of the audience? And we thought, Maybe not. Maybe not. So I'm not saying we've decided not to do it live again. I'm just saying we haven't decided 
to say yes to it yet. We're still trying to figure it out. And if you've got a thought or whatever, I would love to hear. Please leave your thoughts in the comments section below. All right, final question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from uh, Conlon Brown, who writes, I have extremely intelligent female friends who are worried that studios are too stubborn to ever start regularly making female-led superhero films. I, however, am not worried. There is yet to be a very successful female superhero film, but there was a time when superhero films in general didn't have a strong track record. With both Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman coming out in the next few years, and the strong competition driving risk-taking, it seems inevitable that female-led superhero films will become commonplace in the near future. Am I wrong? Well, uh, Conlon, it really depends. You see, has there been a disturbing lack of representation for female superhero-driven films? I don't know if you know this, but females make up roughly 50% of the human race. Um, and yet, there are no female superhero films. Uh, so was there an underrepresentation there? Yes, but... And this is one of those things where I have a very unpopular opinion, but I don't care, because uh, it's what I think, so I'm going to say it, and you're free to agree with it or disagree with it. The reason studios have not made a ton of female superhero films is not because studios are too stubborn to give women their representation in superhero films. That's not it at all. Trust me when I tell you this. Studios are amoral. They are neither good nor bad. In, um, in you know, Dungeons and Dragons terms, they're neutral. They're lawful neutral is what studios are. That's what studios are. They are neither good nor bad. They have no moral compass whatsoever. What they do have a compass in, and this is what we talked about a little bit earlier, is they have a financial co compass, right? They have a financial compass that wherever we'll make the money, ding, that's where their true north is, is money. The studios having not created or, or given us a lot of female-led superhero films the last few years has nothing to do with them being sexist. Trust me, it's not. Um, if they thought female superhero films would make them a billion dollars, they'd be cranking out 25 a year. They absolutely would. I remember I had the same discussion with some friends of mine about you know, despite the fact that, that Hollywood seen everybody says, oh, Hollywood's so liberal. No, Hollywood is amoral. If Hollywood was so liberal, we would have had a lot of gay community represent represented movies. And we have it. We just have it. But I've also, I remember having this discussion with my friend, though, and saying, but man, trust me, this is not because Hollywood is anti-gay. They're not. If Hollywood thought for one minute putting out um, uh, 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 comedies or action films or horror films that had gay themes and were led by, by gay characters in them a lot, They would, and they thought those would make them a lot of money, they have no moral compass. They wouldn't care. They would put out 50 of those a year. Hollywood is amoral. The problem um, with like the superhero, uh, female superhero-led films is that for studios, there is precedence for them that female-led superhero movies have lost money. And ultimately what that means is that the fault is not the studios, the fault is ours. We did not, as audience members, go out and support female-led superhero films when they have come out. And there have been a number of female-led superhero films that the studio has taken shots at, and they failed. They've all failed. We have not gone out to support them. Now, there's an argument to be made. Say, yeah, but John, they put out crappy female superhero films. Hey, look, I, I, I get, I'm not going to argue with you on that point. You're right. But, you know, Transformers 4 was crappy and we went out and supported it. Um, so, look, let's look at movies like Aeon Flux with, I, I believe it was Charlize Theron who was in that. A super Hollywood star, uh, whatever. That movie lost them money. I think worldwide, no, it made $52 million worldwide, cost them $62 million to make. Oh, they only lost $9 million. No, 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 they didn't. They lost a lot more than that because then there's the marketing costs, there's the theatrical cut that theaters keep the money. They lost tons of money on Aeon Flux. Then there was Supergirl. Supergirl made $14 million at the worldwide box office. $14 million at the, at the worldwide box office. Then you talk about my girl, Jennifer Garner, my all-time celebrity crush. Um, Jennifer Garner's Electra made $56 million worldwide, 
cost $43 million to make. Oh, it made money. It made like 12. No, no, no. It lost money. Then you add 15 to $20 million from marketing costs. One third of the box office gets kept by theaters. Guess what? Electra lost money. Then look at the biggest example of all of them. Catwoman with one of the biggest superstars in Hollywood just coming off her Academy Award win, Halle Berry. $82 million that movie made worldwide on a $100 million budget. The studio took like a $40 million bath on that movie. So you see, Hollywood has put out female superhero movies. They have. But audiences didn't run out to see them. So then the question is, whose fault is that? Trust me, if studios thought by cranking out female-led superhero films, they would make much, a bunch of money, they would be cranking them out like crazy. This is not about Hollywood going, we don't want to support women. That's not that at all. Hollywood is amoral. They only, they own, their moral compass is guided by money. Completely is. But, like I said, the other argument, of course, well, John, Catwoman sucked. Electra sucked. Uh, Aeon Flux, I didn't think Aeon Flux sucked. Um, Supergirl sucked. Yeah, but we are now entering an age that that was another era. And now we see the studios are getting ready to try it again. We got Wonder Woman coming. We got Captain Marvel coming. And if these work and the audience, that's you and that's me. If we show the studios that we will support good female-led superhero movies, then studios will start cranking them out. They will start cranking them out as long as we show them that we are interested in these films. The studios will only do what they think the audience wants them to do. And if we, and the only way we tell them what we want them to do is not with our mouths, is not with our emails, it's with our dollars. That's how we communicate with Hollywood studios, is our dollars. That's how they hear us. If we spend money on something, that's them hearing us. If we don't spend money on something, that's the Hollywood studios hearing us. So they're getting ready to take, both Warner Brothers um, and Marvel are getting ready to take another shot at female-led superhero films, support them when they come out. You know, I'd say this, even if Wonder Woman is bad, go out and watch it once. Just, just, just go out and watch it once because that'll tell the studios we're interested in female-led superhero films, but by the way, your movie sucked. Whatever, support it. Um, if you really want to see this type of thing change, show Hollywood that we want it to change. Anyway, that's it for me, guys, for uh, this installment of Mailbag. Thanks so much for being here. Listen, guys, the most important thing about this show, this is supposed to be a conversation, even though it's just me in front of my microphone. Um, and I'm hoping next week I'm going to be able to do Mailbag again with a co-host because, you know, I, I had Ashley Mova with me for a long time and she's just not, she hasn't been available. So um, I'm hoping I'm going to find somebody who's available and start doing it with another person next week because I really enjoy it more when I'm doing it with another person. That's just my opinion, whatever. Um, but listen, the most important thing here is not listening to what I say. The important thing here is not agreeing with what I say. And the, the important thing is not disagreeing with what I say. The important thing is knowing what you guys think. Jump into the comments section of this video and leave your thoughts on any or all the questions that we addressed here today. I really want to hear input. Let's have a fun conversation because what's the point in agreeing on everything? There's no point to that. Um, let's have some fun. All right, thanks a lot, guys. For hey, listen, don't forget, guys, we are now a part of Collider, the awesome entertainment website bookmark in your browser right now if you haven't already collider.com frosty steve weintraub and his team on the website do such a fantastic job over there make sure you are bookmarking and visiting that site daily and hey make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel collidervideo.com you're watching this right now subscribe to the channel stay up to date on all the videos that we're creating here and uh, by the way guys you can follow me on twitter and on facebook i'm gonna let you know i actually make a lot of announcements and give you know, movie talk and mailbag and Clyder video viewers, a lot of heads up through my personal channels. So make sure you're following me on Twitter or follow me on Facebook or both um, at John Campia. Follow us there. And don't forget, Collider actually has a uh, Collider video has an Instagram account. So make sure you're following our Instagram account. Wendy, a bunch of people are taking pictures, behind the scenes pictures all the time and putting them up. Follow us on Instagram at Collider Video. So that'll do it for me, guys. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you guys so much. Go Ronda Rousey. I'm going to look stupid now. She loses. And anyway, so my name is John Campion for Collider Video. And until next time, bye-bye.